Welcome, everyone. My name is Jean Parker. We're going to hear some wonderful and remarkable illustrations and stories from our guest, Vahid Kamzi. And he is the head of industry transformation at SAP in Germany and a founder of SAP's social startup accelerator program called One Billion Lives. And one of the things that he says is that he believes that one line of code can change the world. People are really looking forward to listen to your experience. Uh, a, a quite interesting experience, right? From uh, three major organizations, uh, Shell, Boston Consulting, and most recently uh, SAP. And I think uh, the reason why we've been, uh, we've been attracted by your experience is that it seems that you really manage, right, to have this uh, this change from within, while other people, most of the time, they rather find it easier, you know, to to quit the organization and to look for for happiness and a meaningful career uh, outside uh, the organization. I'm thinking maybe maybe if there's something that you would like to share with um, with the group before they actually start asking you some question. Really, something that I think that. The red thread of your life is written at the end. But when you're looking forward, when you look at the future, you just don't know. And there's so many choices, so many opportunities and possibilities. And I guess when you're driven by purpose, by some doing something good, by being around good people, things fall into place. And then when you look backwards, then you can say, oh yeah, that's why it made sense. And then these things made sense. I met that person. and. What is the job? What is the next course? It's extremely difficult. No one knows what's happening. Like when they asked the interview question of what are you going to do in five years? Nobody knew five years ago, or even two years ago, that we'll be on Zoom all talking, working from home. So I think that's one thing which kind of gives me comfort, which is I don't need to know. I don't need to know what's happening in two years, five years. I just need to make the right choices. And the right choices are the five people that are around me the people that inspire me? Do I spend time with the right type of people? And my cycle has been every six or seven years, I've switched. I did six, seven years at Shell, six, seven years at Boston Consulting, and now I'm at six, seven years. So this group is kind of my, my, my thinking group. So maybe, um, do I need to make the change? Do I need to change the people? Have, have you seen any, any similarities uh, every time that you have decided to make a change? Every five years, as has happened something that you yeah. can say uh, the same trigger that made you do the change or every time is something different? Yeah, I mean, the first one, I mean, these are kind of classical things, right? It's kind of imposter syndrome, right? You become successful at something, but then at some point you kind of think that you're faking it, that you don't belong. And actually at Shell, I actually really didn't feel that the type of people that were around me are the people that I want to be with not because of the company. Shell people are very good people. It's like a really deeply thoughtful, professional, amongst the oil and gas companies, it's probably the most, the company that always thought about sustainable energy. So it's nothing about this, but it's just the people I was around with. I never felt in, and I think that's almost what made me say, okay, I kind of faked it so much, I'm gonna disappoint, so I need to find another environment. And the same thing within BCG, it was very fast career. Okay, I, I thought, I'm, you know, it's up or out in consulting. Every year I was like, okay, I'm going to get fired. I do one more year. <laughs> okay. And you know, like it's super tough. And then, then it was actually in BCG was not about this, was more about the private life. So my wife told me either your BCG partner or my, you're my partner with two kids and you being with Ralph in Manila Monday and Tuesdays. Wednesday and Thursdays, I was in Jakarta and Friday at home. So that, the second one was a burnout. But then I was really reflecting for this career. I don't want to leave after five years. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's old fashioned or passe, but at some point, you need to stick with it. The things that scare you, if you feel the imposter syndrome, or maybe that's the time to stay in and to kind of break the next level of barrier. The easy way is to go somewhere else and restart. When I went out of high school, I really wanted to change the world. I was involved in all of these youth programs, and then I fell into kind of uni, which was studying hard engineering, shell projects, left and right travel, in Boston consulting, amazing impact, 
but I felt, hey, I'm really not doing this. Then I joined SAP and my first program was actually what you mentioned, One Billion Lives, this program, which is kind of, suddenly somehow we created this social imp impact imp program. One woman in the Philippines actually, that was waiting, she, was ca she had ca cancer patient, she waited outside in the rain to get the prescription from the doctor. And it was a craziness that you had to do everything on paper, submit the form and there was a lot of corruption. So we said, okay, let's digitize this. She said, look, I cannot do it. So I want SAP to help me headquarters in the region. So we helped her and said, okay, there's so many of our employees who have great ideas. Let's put them together, pitch contest. We'll bring them together. Somebody else in India, his mom had cancer. He needed big data problems to solve for cancer patients in India. And with two people, two employees came with problems. We didn't think much. We said, let's do an accelerator. It's a global program. There's something like 150 teams globally around the world. And I felt that all of the things I had done before, both my career in Shell and my career in BCG had kind of prepared me to be able to have this type of, I could never have done it before. Mm. Even if I was just thinking about, hey, I need to make an impact. Maybe it's all of the things that prepare you for that moment where you have the opportunity, where you have the skill, the network, the CV, the brand recognition. And I think, of course, it makes sense during the time, but at some points you're at that moment of opportunity and everything you've done before somehow comes together. Now that listening to you, I feel that you had, had this urge of making an impact, right? Throughout the, your career. And as you say, you probably got prepared. Uh, organization after organization to be where you are today. So my, my reflection is this social impact program that you are uh, leading at SAP. Is your way to change from within? Is this program giving you the right motivation to stay? Or, or is there something in SAP that uh, makes your career meaningful or more meaningful compared to the previous organization you have been working at? Honestly, I think being in the software industry now, it's incredible. It's really an incredible space right now. And that's why when I said one line of codes can change the world, when um, COVID hit and everybody needs to kind of move, go to a e-commerce or a marketplace with one line of codes that they added in, the, in their web pages, they could actually become a, in, in a marketplace to access their goods. So to completely lots of small businesses so that's why I think it's not only about SAP, it's just being in this industry. When I see, for instance, the open source movement, right? The way the open source movement supported COVID. You know, we think a lot about big tech, oh, screwing the people, they go to Congress and this. I find 99% of people in the tech industry, first of all, they have a lot of choices of jobs. So they will actually actively choose with whom they want to work. There is a give first mentality so supporting the ecosystem, smaller businesses, of course, it's extremely competitive. But when COVID hit, you could see a lot of the companies one by one opening up the code, open source, contributing. So that's what I find very exciting. And now that we're at this, uh, COVID is gone. But the next way, which is around sustainability, again, you see the same thing. Of course, technology alone will not change the world. We need you to change our lives, the way that we do things. It's not just by beautiful dashboards, but I can see that in the tech space, there's a lot of purpose-driven people. Majority of people are really, really enthusiastic. And one last point is I think a lot of people are still consumers and I like it that it's becoming easier and easier to be a producer, Get, getting active on LinkedIn, then you're not just consuming social media, you're creating just by being I don't know, in Clubhouse, you can contribute. So it's very easy to switch from this. My favorite example is uh, Wikipedia. Nobody's paid, get paid to Wikipedia. There's so many millions of contributors and maybe something, you should try to edit something in Wikipedia. Then you feel you're part of the community that is helpful rather than just being a consumer. And it's very easy. And try to put something wrong. Within 30 minutes, it's gonna be edited out. So it's extremely accurate. It's a platform where they have unlocked the goods based on a, some very basic tech platform. So I'm very, very excited about the software industry. Of course, lots of positives and also lots of negatives, but that's what's keeping me excited. I had a question, if I may, about energy. 
if you stay or go to a different place. It depends on the energy that's around you. And from what I'm hearing, there's three levels of energy. is energy from the people that are around you. There's energy from the sector. You're very excited to be in the tech sector. And there's energy that comes in the specific projects that you're working on, because tech is all sorts of things. And you mentioned some really interesting projects. And I was wondering which of these three energies may be the ones that you would suggest people look into when they're looking for a meaningful career. Sometimes the job title that you have, the company that you have, the location that you have actually is not what will determine. I always thought, okay, I have to be an NGO. I have to quit my job or I have to be an entrepreneur, you know, or I have to work with, I don't know, with schools, philanthropists to have the impact. So my sense is the company is actually not the one thing that determines. It's actually the, the people and the ability to kind of influence the projects that you are in. I think the job title, and that's something, an illusion we make ourselves, oh, maybe when I have this rank, if I was a CEO, I could do this. And I think in a very large company, what I noticed with this SAP One Billion Lives program, we didn't have any money. There was nothing. I mean, it was two employees who were actually wanting money from us. They said, I'm, my SAP insurance is not covering my family in the Philippines with the cancer treatment that we have. And this is, please help me. So the ability to be with the right people, then you suddenly unlock, unlock things. Nobody says no to a good idea. Like literally nobody, it was, had almost too many people that wanted and you know that you have to keep it with two or three people. And that's what I saw. Sometimes these, nobody follows the leaders that's negative that's always complaining, which is kind of the easy thing to do in a corporate. When somebody has an idea and is driven, people want to contribute, be part of. So that's what I've seen the, to your things. Company, I wouldn't think so. Projects, yeah. And if you're able to kind of unlock it, suddenly things happen. And it's not because of your rank or this. It, it's better about the passion that you're bringing and one or two people that can kind of help you. Right. I guess I, what I was looking for is how do you get people on board with it? You're saying it naturally, they, they're attracted to it. But, you know, for in your case, you had a project that came to you and you were able to then leverage your your past, your history. You know, you said, look back. You were able to leverage that to, to help it to happen. Um, I, I think in a lot of cases, like for mine, I'm looking at it and saying, how do I create that project? to create the impact, right? Not, it's not falling in my lap in a way and to say, yeah. how can I take yeah. this forward, but rather creating that impact and then getting people around you to come with you. I think that's a challenge that, yeah. that I see in the corporate world. No, you're right, you're totally right. And interestingly, to give you the background story of this One Million Lives, it was a strategy retreat. So I joined from corporate strategy and I was supposed to be like principal from Boston Consult. He'll help us do the five-year plan. So I brought all of the leaders sit together, we came up with three big ideas. One of them was corporate secrets, but one of them is, hey, we're gonna attack all of the SME in, uh, in the Southeast Asia, give them the software for free and drive the utilization. The second one was on the mobile phone. We said, look, the top five apps on the, on the iPhone, you know, the, you have to be in the top five. So how do we get kind of the second one was mobility. And the third one was 1 billion lives. I kind of steered a little bit then the steering group to say, hey, the first one, the mid-market and the second one, everybody does it, but we can steer. So my sense is, Shaim, you're totally right. I mean, once you have this thinking, you kind of need to wait for the, the thing that you can shape and steer because else it's difficult to do it in a complete vacuum. My sense is now with the sustainability trends, with purpose, with diversity, there is enough leaders also in the corporate world that would be keen to it's difficult to say no to these type of projects say hey what are your top three things that you're doing for diversity we're too much like this this it becomes difficult as a management actually to even say no so so i think we're in a better position but i understand if you're in sales pressure quota carriers you're driven by the quarters the bandwidth that you have is very little for that but i would say yeah it doesn't fall on the laps you have to, but you're right, you need to have at least a two or three percent, plus you need to have one or two people kind of allies to get this. Yeah, I guess I guess one of the challenges is, uh, to your point, is if it's not supported from the top, it's very hard within the corporate environment to 
uh, to drive engagement is what I find. Yeah. You know, it's that, that bottoms up approach seems to work in a, in a community sense, right? In my local community, you can create that bottoms up approach to, to moving something along. But in a corporate sense, I find that if it's not supported at the top, it just, it, it loses every, every level you go down, you just lose a little bit more rather than gaining. No, I agree. It's just that for, I think now is a really good moment because on the, the other side, purpose, diversity, sustainability. I mean, ask any of the senior, okay, what's your strategy for this? Or what do you think about this? It's very difficult to say no right now. Before, you know, a couple of years, you could say, yeah, that's not really thing. And, but, and I can see it myself in my position where uh, you have to choose the type of senior leaders that you were to work with. And I mean, it's a position of luxury to choose jobs, but if you're able to do that, then, yeah. So en engagement is key to drive this change. And I'm just wondering, do, did you feel it? Did you feel it was impossible in the previous organization and you feel in the workplace where you are now, you actually can uh, drive this engagement or it was, you were not trained in your previous organization really to drive engagement change and uh, find this clearer sense of service and purpose that I'm listening. Each one of us balances what you do in your person. And I think what Shamim says, at some point in your life, you're, you cannot do that through your career and you do it through your community around you. And look, sometimes it has more impact to, to help the neighbor or the neighborhood or people who are around you or help your spouse take the back seat and let the other one, you know, it's difficult for the family with young kids. So I guess that's where the balancing act is. And if you want to stay in the corporate world, yeah, you're right. At some points, you just need to toughen it up. Just need to two or three years and wait. And because the opportunities come when it comes, I mean, for me, it's more like, tit not Titanic, this is bad, but a, a, tit a big ship, corporate world is a big ship. You're able to steer it one or two degrees wow it can do massive damage but then you have to wait for the right point and when is the right leverage if you want to leave yeah but you're going to be on a speedboat or you're going to be on a motorboat that's much more agile but you will not have this uh, this followership and impact so i think that's where i have a lot of uh, admiration for people who stayed in corporate don't get disillusioned. I was disillusioned and I changed, but uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see how much you've been able, you know, to, to find your sense of, uh, of purpose and service where you are today. And I'm thinking about you, Nan, you are at the beginning of your journey, uh, of your meaningful career. I don't know if you're in your uh, group at the beginning, any interesting question came up for Vahid that you would like to share? Exactly, I just joined recently um, my new job Although um, probably it's not so like my dream one and, and moment. However, I think there are also some common areas that I also perceive no matter what kind of jobs. Um, how do you deal with those politics um, was inside of the, the company that people are kind of um, very cautious, especially in large, like you said, in a large uh, organization. People are sometimes very, knows what to do. And majority, I think 99% knows where, where the direction is. Um, but they just pretend probably they, they don't know or unseen the things that they should do. <laughs> and that sometimes makes me really frustrated. For me, every time I got discouraged, I had this group, EBBF, my annual retreat. You need to find who's your community. And I like, honestly, this group I like because everybody's so different. When I, I, I kind of Googled this a couple of years, like, wow, this is the most random group of people. We have really nothing, very little in common, but yet it's a group that has this direction. And that's why, to be honest, that's why the annual retreats and just what's your true north? Because if you believe it's the right organization and you're going to grow, yeah, you need to tough it up at some point. But keep your true north. Is it like a personal faith or is it a group of like-minded people that can still give you the, the map is changing, but the true north, as long as you have it, then you know that you can check in with yourself. Hey, where am I? What's my sounding board? Who are the people that I talk to? And of course, yeah, if after two or three years, it's really like this and there's no chance, I think it, you, may, you need to make the change. But I think the beginning of life in the corporate world, yeah, you just have to tough it up. On the other hand, your life is very precious. You know, you're, you're I don't know. I mean, some of us have the privilege to taste, take a couple of years to wait and look what's really the career. Sometimes you have some debts to pay. You just have to 
payable, so I don't know the situation, but I would say at some point you have to kind of earn your ranks in the corporate world. But you know, the beauty of it is that things are changing so quickly. I was uh, at the airport, this was before Corona, I was hearing a discussion between the mom and the, the kids and I was saying, no, honey, YouTuber is not a job. <laughs> YouTuber is not a career. And now I look in Corona, yeah, it is a job. They're the only people who make money. YouTuber and influencers. So within 18 months, and that's why nowadays, it's not anymore, at least in the software industry, about which school you've been, with your resume. It's about your GitHub. What's your curriculum? What are the websites that you've built with the Coursera and the online learning? So I think it's broke a lot of the myth. The corporate world was very used to hire bachelors or masters and you go through this. But with what's been happening the last 18 months, the passion and opportunity that you sh and willingness that you show has really changed the way people are hiring. So I think it's going to be mostly for the next generation. But I see really the corporate world changing a lot in what they value and the type of skill they want. Do you think then you're encouraging, for example, young people who are probably trying to spend like 30% of the time uh, like doing some side jobs, which they really passionate about, or like what you said, doing being YouTubers or grow, grow some certain skills, which is probably not so relevant to to their current career yet, but in long term investment. So, you do, do you really encourage people to do that? I think absolutely. Nowadays, people that are passionate about their own project that can drive because you hire more for passion and attitude than the skills. Skills you can learn nowadays. Of course, the big expertise in oil and gas. Someone who runs a refinery is different, but uh, someone who shows passion, who shows that they have the drive, the dynamism, and the, the, what you know becomes less important and less relevant versus the passion. Have you done something on your own? It's interesting because in the corporate world, so I got a new team and I told them, look, the most important thing for me is not what you do this year. I think a learning team is a le it is thinking team. So what do you want to learn? What are the things that you're learning? I said, oh, I haven't done all of my compliance trainings. You know, in every corporate you have, you have to do antitrust. And, and the thinking sometimes in corporate is what my learning is going to be the curriculum that I have for my job description, the mandatory training, the compliance training. What you want is people who are passionate, who find the 30%, as you say, what, what's your 30% or it becomes a 50% or it becomes what they're passionate about. And I'm sure that this will be recognized by whoever is around you. Vahid, in the past 18 months now, almost two years, of course, uh, many, many things have changed in the world. We don't know if these changes are permanent or not. People saying, look, I really want to now work much more purposefully, bring out my particular passion in my work. How is that affecting corporates such as yours? And do you think this change is permanent or is this a response to what has happened and it will kind of dissipate over time? So I go back to uh, Bob Henderson, his lecture, when he gave to us at the, again, another EBF event, you can Google Bob Henderson strategy versus purpose, right? That was the, the, the term that he gave to us. So, his, so our view is kind of bottom up from COVID era, but his view is that the world fundamentally has changed. It was driven by strategy and KPIs, but now COVID or not COVID or independently of that, the way the corporations are even being steered to learn with speed, to, to leverage diversity, to foster innovation, you need to kind of unlock the passion of your people. So even COVID or not, I think, but yeah, I would see in our teams, absolutely. I mean, in the software industry, you cannot hire people. If they're super smart product managers in software, they will all start their own startup. If they, can, they don't want to start their own startup, they'll go to Facebook, Google. Number three, they'll go to Salesforce. Fantastic, cool company in the Valley. Number four, they'll go to, to BCG, Accenture, then SAP. I'm having, I'm getting only the sixth, I mean, right? I mean, a German software company, how exciting is that? They do stuff for manufacturing and the supply chain. So unless, and basically that's why the pitch that we have is about sustainability. Come because we own all of the supply chain of all of the biggest companies will help you really change the world. So we cannot even hire if we don't have purpose. 
So I absolutely think, I think for us in a highly competitive environment, because people have the choice. Also, the other big topic is the diversity topics, a bit different than purpose. But I think it became so big in our industry that there is a huge pressure in terms of uh, you cannot have a panel which is very uniform. If you have this, there's going to be such a pressure on you. I think these are good forces. These are, I think when you talk about the century of light, the light has been, it's not because it's a century that's beautiful. It's just that the light on everything of, of these actions that were happening, but nobody knew now, there's a light on it. People see through it around sustainability and around diversity. So, and these are the fundamental, thing, fundamental things that all of us believe. So I think these are coming to light, all of the things that we're kind of hoping for and wishing for, which we in our depth believe it's true. Now the rest of the world or even the corporate world is going in this direction. I'm enjoying being squeezed also because, yeah, because I'm, my team is not diverse. My team is not sustainable. And the young people are really challenging us to be. I'm just, uh, before we conclude, I, I was just reflecting uh, on the importance of network that you mentioned before. And I, I would love actually to ask Ralph a question. Uh, first of all, <laughs> amazing that you had someone, you know, you could call in the middle of the night and have those uh, meaningful midnight calls. <laughs> I wish I could have someone uh, to bounce ideas in the middle of the night regarding my career. But I, I would be interesting to hear uh, from Ralph what has been his perception of your journey uh, in the past years. And if you, Ralph, uh, uh, where are you in your journey if you think those midnight meaningful conversations also help you in achieving uh, a more meaningful career? Thank you for that question, Martina. I mean, I've, I've worked with Fahid a couple of years ago and I've, you know, I've seen him as a, as a different person. At that time, you, you see somebody who's super aggressive, super effective in their work, um, you know, making a big impact. And sometimes you go through really, I guess, ups and downs because we, we make very long hours um, during our case, our case studies or our case projects. But I think it's the times when it's, it's not necessarily in that moment of time that you appreciate what you're doing. I think it's sometimes more the reflection after a few years and seeing how um, somebody, for example, Fahid has impacted my life um, in certain ways of how I do things up to today and how he has planted that seed with me and how I'm planting these seeds with others, right? And I think that's where there are these very meaningful or purposeful connections that we have with people, um, whether we know them or not. I think people are people at the end of the day, and it doesn't matter where we come from or what we do, but I think we have some sort of values um, or something that we're looking for. And I think that's kind of the question that I wanted to ask by you, because I, I've seen you in you know, the, the consulting role at different aspects. Um, but my question to you then is like, what, what drives you or what keeps you going at the end of the day? And I think second is, even though you might not be going through the best moments in your career, um, how do you take a step back and focus on, you know, the, big, the bigger picture to, to keep you going and keep encouraging others to do the right thing, uh, to be more purposeful? What Ralph was saying is that it was not midnight calls. We finished working at midnight, but it was the most beautiful time and nobody complained about overworked you know we were like another very exciting group of people Ralph what keeps you going my sense is for me it's two things learning and the people that I'm around with the the, the part around learning about I'm I'm tinkering now I bought a soldering kit but of course there's people around and I guess that's why I mean I'm just repeating this but this group around EBBF to be honest and what I tell you one of the critical moments this year so at the beginning of this year I changed my job as a COO of a global org. It's a unit of around 800 people. We received a team of 100 of a product that we're terminating. If you search, it's called SAP Leonardo. It was kind of our machine learning IoT. It didn't work. Gave me a team of 100 people. Okay, I have 100 people, but no budget to pay their salaries. Corona came. The travel is going to go down so I could fund. And then I said, this is very, very difficult. These 100 people, like, how do I do that? They're completely different skills than what we have. And I talked to Mahmoud. And Mahmoud was like, people change, people learn. Nothing, these are people, and as you say, people are people, Ralph. Nowadays, people can completely switch. You need to trust these people that they can learn. That's where, Ralph, I say this a group, what the, what's the group of people that are around you that you can ask the question at your quick, critical times? And actually, for all of these 100 people, I kind of rewrote CVs. 
put them on interviews. 87 of them found jobs. Three of them, they were in countries with social protection, so they got paid very nicely. Having the right people that you can call off when you want to have these type of meaningful moments are super important. Having the community of people around you when you're kind of down in your corporate career. So you need this group of people that could be different, that could be similar, that could be around you, that could be international. But I think that's what keeps me going. And every time I go to this group, they tell me what they do. It's like, oh, I will never, this is amazing. So I think having the people that inspire you and you inspire them also. Ralph, you're super inspirational for me. Young graduates coming out of school, you were coming with so many privileges from what you had, your network, your school, yet you were the only ones in the team who stayed out till midnight. A lot of people that were coming from your school, your degree, they just have the easy job, stay at home and stay in the family business. You hustled like there was no one. He's there, he's there. And you remember so many interview preparation around. So I think it's maybe this kind of the people that you inspired that and that got inspired by you. Thank you, Wahid, uh, really on behalf of everyone. And now I would love this conversation to go on forever. So thank you very much on behalf of EBBF and everyone. Uh -huh.